welcome to our symposium on new visions for big history. Uh, I am super excited uh, to be bringing uh, this symposium to you. Um, uh, you know, I developed the tree of knowledge uh, sort of way back in 1997 um, and had no idea uh, that there had been uh, the development of a scholarship movement uh, by Dave Christian, uh, dating back to the late 1980s, really, uh, in terms of that was called Big History. Uh, that was this interdisciplinary structure uh, for thinking systematically about the big view of the universe, basically on the dimensions of time uh, and complexity. Uh, I circled in, I developed a friendship with Eric Hiazon, a physicist who was involved in that, um, and uh, made a number of connections with the big history community. However, one of the things that I noticed from my perspective, as a sort of big picture psychologist perspective, is that big history didn't really grapple with the issue of psychology, the problem of psychology. And I wasn't sure how it actually held its structure in relationship to practice and embodiment, um, the arts. Uh, is it really uh, capable of engendering uh, within us uh, the kind of understanding both of the universe and of ourselves that would enable us to grab the right relation, to use a little of John Verbeke's language. Um, and I felt that as a psychotherapist, I felt that as sort of a philosopher type interested in wisdom. Um, well, it turns out I'm not alone in that. Um, and what we have uh, today is a couple of, I think, leading thinkers uh, who are bringing uh, wonderfully rich perspectives uh, on how we might grip uh, the self-world relation, how we might think about ourselves. We're going to start uh, with Tyler. Uh, Tyler is going to be talking about a general uh, evolutionary dynamic view. I encountered Tyler. We were paired in a big history uh, presentation, uh, and I was encouraged to read his Quirks to Culture book. Um, and in it, I saw a delineation of levels and of what he labeled brilliantly combogenesis, by specifying when we're talking about big history, you better be clear, we're talking about uh, the evolution of our history, quirks to culture. Um, and what is the nature of that emergence? What is the nature of that leveling process? And he delineated a brilliant articulation. And not only that, he specified the leveling, he saw realms that overlap tremendously with my sense of matter, life, mind, and culture. And he and I have since uh, synced up significantly. Um, I listened to Scott talk about uh, his view of wild systems and the deep appreciation that he has as us as entropy to producing structures uh, and the nature of how we can embed ourselves in an energy entropy systemic relationship, both scholarly and artistically um, in a way. Uh, and he's got some fascinating stuff that I hope we'll talk about uh, in his talk is wild borders on the foundational nature uh, of aboutness. I forgot to mention Tyler's talk will be on general evolutionary dynamics and the theories of Volk, Henricus, and Azarine. Bobby Azarine will be giving us a talk and Tyler will be um, uh, the moderator for that. Um, then I come to Rich uh, and, hit, and then Rita. Um, so Rich uh, also entered, uh, officially entered the big history world, um, saw its potential, um, but came from a perspective of love of nature, of love of embodiment, uh, and saw in what was missing was the process by which we could connect our felt embodiment in nature, our love of nature, our nature in ourselves and ourselves in nature uh, in a way that again offered a perspective on energy flow. Oika uh, is his concept uh, that he talks about basically the ecology energy informational flow structure. Uh, and he is paired with Rita. So his talk will be introducing Oika from Big History to the Bodavistas view, Val, I'm sorry. Uh, and he is paired in a number of fascinating um, endeavors uh, with his colleague Rita, um, who will, is an artist. Uh, and they do uh, brilliant and beautiful things together. I've gotten a slice of some of what they do. Uh, it's inspiring. We've had a wonderful, a number of wonderful conversations. And Rita will be uh, giving us our talk on Oika participation, cultural continuity, uh, of an ecology of wisdom 
Uh, so this is a super exciting thing. Really look forward to it. Um, we're going to start with Tyler Volk, uh, and he's going to uh, lead us off today. So uh, looking forward to this uh, enormously. Thank you very much, folks. Uh, so Tyler, uh, you need to uh, unmute yourself there, friend. Let me say thanks, Greg, again. Um, so, so this talk is uh, has a very concrete focus in that I'm looking at the big history or cosmic evolution work of Greg, Bobby, who's going to be giving a talk at one o'clock today, um, more, more at length, and myself. Uh, from the viewpoint of convergence that we had independently, because we all we all did this work independently. We did, I did not know Greg at the time, although we've worked uh, some since then. And I did not know Bobby until his book came out. And some um, people in the International Society for System Science um, uh, uh, told me that there's some overlap with my with my work. And I was glad to see that. And the idea is that we all in our I'll call them theories just for, you know, without trying to parse the word, you know, too, too carefully, uh, came up with uh, evolutionary dynamics, a general form of evolutionary dynamics as markers or as recurrent themes within these um, maps and time that we developed. So that's going to be my, my focus of the talk today. I, I do have slides. But I just wanted to tell you what the focus really is. Some of the slides are, are going to have more information that I'm going to show, that I'm going to talk about. So I'll just point out some of the uh, features and some of the slides, but that is going to be the main, the main body of the talk. So Greg, I'm going to switch over to the uh, presentation at this point. That's great. Should be able to share screen straight away. And okay. You see it, uh, Greg? We're good. We're looking at your screen. Yes. Okay. Good. Oh, but I should do. I should do the full screen. All right. Uh, so, just a tiny bit of background about myself. I'm a biosphere scientist, um, but I've been involved in systems for a, a long time. Interest probably coming out of um, architecture school originally as undergraduate, looking looking at things as structures no, and processes. Please go ahead. Um, but a number of books, Meta Patterns, Gaia's Body, What is Death, CO2 Rising, Quarks to Culture that Greg brought up. The, the, the talk is really coming out of the work on meta patterns and quarks to culture. And since we heard from Corey yesterday on this concept of uh, arch disciplinary and, and, and large arches, I thought I'd just show this quickly uh, of the, the, these were the meta patterns that I developed in my book, Meta Patterns Across Space, Time and Mind, various principles that occur across various fields. And down at the bottom there, the, con the concentric circles that have holarchy versus hierarchy, holons and clonons. Um, within that chapter, I, was I started looking at layers of systems in a preliminary way, not as in much detail as I did in my Quarks to Culture book, but I did get into the idea of stratification over time. And originally I was, uh, I, I can't talk in this talk about all the people that have talked about uh, evolutionary dynamics in various ways. I'm focusing on on Greg, Bobby, and myself in this, but I do want to give a, um, a shout out to, I'll go back to that other slide, to Jacob Bernowski, who very early on influenced me with his concept of stratified stability, that the universe occurs. Uh, you can think of it as time to time well, he was really dealing with the a big history, the evolution of complexity through strata that become sequentially stable. Now, as I said, my talk today is specifically about evolutionary dynamics or general evolutionary dynamics, or what I will sometimes call PVS dynamics, that involve a recurrent and intertwined um, sub-processes of propagation, variation, and selection. And something similar has been called by ver uh, other names. You see a logical skeleton, Darwin machines, algorithms, engines, formulas, heuristics, recipes. I like recipe by David Sloan Wilson, ingredients by William Calvin, Calvin and myself, uh, meta pattern. And by this, I don't mean any sort of change in time. 
which is okay too, because uh, astro uh, cosmologists talk about the evolution of gal uh, the evolution of a galaxy as it changes over time. So I'm not trying to limit the word evolution. That this is a larger debate, but specifically that there can be uh, intertwined sub processes that open up possibility spaces in a certain kind of way, which one can call general evolutionary dynamics. And I'm going to show that Greg and Bobby and I, as people who are you know, currently publishing and active in this, independently converged on as something very important in a big history um, look. So my work uh, towards evolutionary dynamics came about from the quarks to culture in which I specifically tried to make cases for 12 fundamental levels of combogenesis, which Greg referred to, in which prior existing things with relations join and merge to form larger things where they have new relations that then can cycle up uh, from right to left and right uh, back and forth in which you develop a series of levels. Many people have talked about levels. I tried to develop it in a certain logical way in which each level had to come into existence before the next subsequent level came, could come into existence because of the, prob because of the possibility space opened up by each level. And when I did that, they clustered into, uh, from, from my viewpoint, three realms. Oops, I don't know what's happening here. Um, did that switch screen, Greg? Yep, okay. Uh, and, but this was from my big history paper in 2020, in which I already knew Greg's work. So in, in, my, in my book, I had chemical evolution, biological evolution, uh, a cognitive of PVS, a cognitive PVS, which would be learning in animals, and then uh, a more complex cultural evolution of people. I had these as evolutionary dynamics that came into existence at certain markers in, in the big history scheme, which is here from left to right, even though it's concentric, uh, it's a concentric um, buildup. Now, um, let, let, me, let me show you on something on Greg's then. Okay, so here's, here's Greg's uh, tree of knowledge taken from his uh, Journal of Big History paper. And specifically, life is second dimension. If you look at the lower left there, he's got uh, the green, uh, three green arrows going in a circle of variation selection and retention. And Greg and I have talked about this. This is, this is um, um, a mechanism of evolutionary dynamics that, that Darwinian evolutionary dynamics very well understood and, and known. Now, if we go to Greg's next level of mind, which comes in with animals of nervous systems of a particular complexity, we have variation selection and retention uh, in a behavioral selection that happens as animals learn to behave. Greg's fourth dimension of culture. He also, look at the arrows down at the bottom uh, left there again, these are light blue colored, variation selection and retention. He also sees a, um, a, a sort of a cyclic, but then progressive feedback loop that is involved in culture. And I was very excited when I saw this in Greg's paper that he published in the Journal of Big History because I saw that, wow, he sees a, 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 a process of evolutionary dynamics with as for as key as 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 uh, very important in the emergence of his, what he was what he calls dimensions of existence. Now, Greg and I have collaborated a bit on this, and last November we were part of a um, big history research group in which we had a position paper in. And through studying Greg's work and our talk, um, I, I'm really convinced now that the animal mental is, is it, it, I did see it as important, but it's, it's really important because it has, for me anyway, it has a, a PVS, the learning 
can come into this. And, and people have worked on this. I'm not going into the details of how this works. I mean, there's different kinds of learning, instrumental learning and, and learning in which animals use modeling in their minds, that, uh, not conscious, probably we don't, well, might be conscious. These are things I'm not getting into. <laughs> I, I try to, I start slipping into them, but I'm going to, I'm going to avoid uh, with, for the sake of time. But the point is that one can look at PVS dynamics and see them as markers, more than markers, they open up new spaces in the kinds of forms and functions that are existing to look at, to open up probability space and see, and these, so these dynamics are very powerful. I mean, Darwin saw this and Darwin even saw that language, for example, has something similar. The evolution of human language is similar to the evolution of, of, um, of, of biology. So Darwin actually saw, saw this, that, that, that evolutionary dynamics applies to more than biology. And many people have. We come to uh, Bobby's work in the Romance of Reality, which he's uh, said he'll be talking about uh, as a ring at one o'clock, and I'll be moderating that. And I'm just pointing out one slide of Bobby's here. I was really excited to read this book because he saw that, first of all, he has hierarchical nested emergence, where I quote here, where functional things come together to make larger functional things, which come together to make even larger ones, and so on. He uses the term multiple realizability, which I like very much, which is also known as substrate independence. I believe Daniel Dennett used this term in which you have processes that come into existence multiple times with different substrates. And that's very, that's, that's exactly the theme of this talk. And Bobby brings up an evolution of mechanisms of evolution, which he calls meta evolution. The main thing here is his EEUDUB framework, which is evolutionary epistemology, universal Darwinism and universal Bayesianism. Bayesianism, which uh, I assume he'll go into some more at one o'clock and I want to engage him some on. But what this is, the main point I wanna make is that what, what this is, is generalized evolutionary dynamics of different names that goes by different names which he also saw as really key to the whole cosmic story from the Big Bang to us, that there are multiple realizations of evolutionary dynamics. Now, one can, I go back to my slide, and I'm gonna overlay it because one of the things I really like about taking evolutionary dynamics as a meta pattern that gets repeated at different times is that you can go into the big history story and look for more examples, use it as a, um, you know, as a tool that you are seeking uh, to, to, to find. And so for example, at the upper left there, Lee Smolin and others have talked about cosmological natural selection was there a natural selection of universes with various rules and various forms of, let's say, the, um, um, the periodic table of physicists, the standard model? And I'm happy to say that uh, Bobby uh, uh, brings us up, and I brought this up in my book, Corks to Culture, a little bit. It's hypothetical. Greg is very aware of this as well. Um, Bobby and others are bringing up, a, uh, there's one idea about how the quantum world works called quantum Darwinism or quantum Bayesianism or cubism. Again, it's, it's in the field of, <laughs> you see this, uh, variations of interpretations of quantum mechanics that we're seeing now, uh, variants uh, coming out and there's kind of an evolutionary selection of models uh, happening. I wanna spend one minute on the upper uh, right there of cultural evolution. This is from uh, my book and uh, uh, Quarks to Culture in which I see cultural evolution as two forms of PVS linked to each other. One is an individual cognitive evolutionary dynamics. This is in the human mind, the way we can go through scenarios in our mind, mental time travel, make choices before we, uh, we, we decide on a, 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 a specific behavior. I see this as coming out of the cognitive PVS of animals, but getting more, more evolved with human language and, and human consciousness. Coupled to social evolutionary dynamics, 
which is in my, in my what I like to emphasize is that it's forms of um, social decision making of various kinds. And I wish I had time to quote you something from uh, uh, Lumen, the the German sociologist, on the importance of yes and no in in human uh, social systems. And, and being able to affirm and deny, and this is re really, I think, consistent with with Greg's um, social aspects of the justification uh, hypothesis. So, so the there are various forms of these. You can think of the PVS uh, dynamics as a, as an umbrella term, um, in which there are specific manifestations of. And this was brought up a lot yesterday by Corey in, in the arch uh, dynamics uh, seekings that where there are common patterns and when they have specific instantiations, they, uh, th 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 there are specifics that you have to really get into to understand. But that's a really interesting, the, the relationship between the general and the specific are super interesting to me. It's continuing to be a, 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 a something I'm working on. So to, to sum up, um, three of us, Greg, Bobby, myself, have independently seen some form of um, evolutionary dynamics with sub-processes that we've outlined, not just in the way of saying this is change, but there are actually sub-processes which you can go into. This is why I like evolutionary dynamics as a pattern, because one can specifically ask, okay, how does selection take place in this instantiation? How does variation take place in this instantiation? And how does propagation take place in this instantiation and compare them? So I'm going to, to thank you and have one more thing to end uh, when I, one more thing to say when I end the graphics. And I think we're going to have a little time for, um, for a talk, Greg. So uh, I can sh stop this uh, screen. Now, the one thing I want to say to close is that um, I can see Greg, Bobby, and myself as uh, as variants on the uh, uh, that it, we were, at the time we were independently seeking um, patterns of the cosmic story or patterns of big history, uh, and so in some ways to bring in the biology here, uh, this is like the wings of bats. One of the famous examples of convergent evolution in biology are the wings of bats, the wings of butterflies, and the wings of birds. They're all flat for large surface area to fly, but they all have different specifics. And so um, this is the way I see um, our, the three of us, Bobby, Greg, and myself with the evolutionary dynamics. We're going to have some differences we'd work out when we get into specifics, but we've all sort of put out these flat wings to fly that in my reading of it are very similar. So convergent evolution in action in the cultural realm. Thank you. All right. Lovely. Uh, thank you. Um, if there's a immediate question, we could potentially field one question, uh, or we can turn it over to Scott and then we'll get into some discussion. Um, not seeing any immediate. Let's see here in the chat. Yeah, I have a question. Okay, go ahead. Hey, Tower. Uh, thanks a lot for that talk. And uh, yeah, I really appreciate you mentioning my work as well. So I was wondering, um, so from quirks to culture, yeah, that that's the the uh, the sequence of hierarchical emergence that has happened so far. I'm wondering where you think it's going, and uh, what role AI has to play in this. <laughs> wow, yeah, um, and I, I saw you ask somebody that a similar question yesterday about. So I, I do I do bring this up in my epilogue of the book. So I didn't have it as a full section of the book, but I but I bring it up. So I do see the planetization, or I, I'll use that word rather than globalization, as a level thirteen. I do I do see a level thirteen as operating. And one question I raise to myself is whether it's going to be a new dynamical realm with a new PVS. And AI has the potential to be an well. We are building evolutionary dynamics into into the AI, um, and the, some of the concerns about whether it takes over and becomes a new or takes over, or whether it gets uh, independently starts working on itself, would almost would be a new dynamical realm 
or do we keep it as humans within you know control within our uh within our uh, cultural realm i am with you that science itself is a pvs system i i i also bring that up is that, that pvs during the human culture itself changes that when we develop various forms of selection to make our um, make our patterns of culture. So I do see the uh, Jacob Brunelski said the most important invention of science is, is, is the process of science itself. And I know you do a lot of work bringing up Karl Popper uh, in, in, in your book. So I do see this just to get move on super concern. Uh, and there's several ways that I think one can use combogenesis and this kind of analysis to frame the questions better about the coming future. So it's maybe something you and I can go into more. Okay, lovely. Yeah, no, uh, and, and certainly if we, when we got into these realms, one of the things that with, from a tree of knowledge vantage point, the life, mind, culture realms uh, can be well specified by mediating by different information processing systems, genetic, cellular, neuroscience, behavior of the animal as a whole, language, and then you say, well, okay, what's digital, right? Uh, the digital does seem to be the potential for another information processing communication network. Uh, so that would be point toward a realm. And especially if they get a PDS uh, evolutionary dynamic and the deep learning AI structure, it seems uh, great and scary simultaneously. So maybe we'll have some of these conversations in the, uh, oh. Greg, just one more thing. One of my concerns is uh, to re is that as you as we build this this nested hierarchical emergence, the human, the individual human, becomes more buried. Totally. So that that comes into this question. <laughs> That's it, um, Brandon. If you can hold that question, why don't we go ahead and uh, get Scott uh, coming uh, onto the stage here? Uh, Scott mm -hmm. Jordan uh, will take us through. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, wild borders uh, on the foundational nature of aboutness. Uh, Scott, welcome some to the uh, symposium. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much, Greg. Thanks to everyone else for uh, for being here and giving me the opportunity to share my ideas with you. You can see from this slide, I'm a psychologist by trade, a philosopher by night. Um, I also run a YouTube channel, Dark Loops Productions, where I try to talk about these things with pop in the, in the medium of pop culture. I also run a little thing called ReggieCon Zoom panels once a month where we celebrate uh, um, History Heritage Months being celebrated in the United States through the discussion of something like a graphic novel or a movie because I think in the Trojan horse model, these are great ways to get these ideas to people. So what I'm gonna talk to you today is about today is being in an energy entropy reality. And the first thing I'm going to start off with is a literary approach, a quote from my favorite author, W.G. Sebald's Rings of Saturn. From the first smoldering taper to the elegant lanterns whose light reverberated around 18th century courtyards, and from the mild radiance of those lamps to the unearthly glow of the sodium lamps that line the Belgian motorways, it has all been combustion. Combustion is the hidden principle behind every artifact we create. The making of a fish hook, manufacture of a china cup, or production of a television program all depend on the same process of combustion. Like our bodies and like our desires, the machines we have devised are possessed of a heart which is slowly reduced to embers. Now, what I want to focus on is that on that last line, because what we have here is when I what I believe to be one of the more beautifully poetic descriptions of what it's like to be a being in an energy transformation system. And what Sabal's doing here in the last sentence is actually equating or equivocating our bodies and our minds with entropy energy systems. What I want to do is talk about wild systems theory, which is a more scientifically grounded approach to the same idea. So what I want to do is talk, borrow from Odom, and instead of talking about all of this we live in as a physical universe, I want to talk about it as a self-organizing energy transformation hierarchy. Self-organizing simply means what you see in a system is a reorganization of what was already there, right? So there's no outside forces dictating what should be or organizing how things happen. 
hierarchy simply means that lower level energy such as that radiated by the sun is captured by um, other forms of energy such as plants which are then captured by other forms of energy we would call herbivores which are captured by other forms of energy we would call carnivores which are captured by other forms of energy we would call credit card companies um the on the one hand that's a joke on the other hand it's not um so interestingly enough once we start talking about this way talking about things this way we're talking about ourselves as energy transformers and we don't need the concepts physical or mental anymore and that's what I'm going to argue I'm going to further propose that we don't need to refer to ourselves or these systems as information systems so how do you be in an energy transformation hierarchy Stuart Kaufman taught us in the 90s about the notion of autocatalysis according to this idea when chemical in the prebiotic soup as the ratio between diverse chemical types and possible reactions between them reached a certain ratio, there was a suddenly a phase transition in the types of organizations that could exist, what we'll call autocatalytic systems, where the chemical interactions, in this case, for example, AB have, a, have an interaction, produce a product AB. AB then serves as a catalyst for the AB reaction. Therefore, we have a system of work, a system of energy transformation, that sustains itself. Kaufman referred to these as self-metabolizing systems. I want to take the idea from here that the work, the work produces products that actually sustain the work, what I will call self-sustaining work. And my objective here is to sort of scale this idea up. So the immersion systems that we look at are themselves autocatalic. So for example, in 19... In the mid 20th century, Donald Hebb taught us that neurons that fire together, wire together. What we know now is that happens because as, or as uh, neurons generate action potentials, retrograde processes through the axon give rise to genetic transcription processes in the nucleus, which then give rise to synapse formation. This means that the work, the energy exchanges of being a neuron sustain being a neuron. Jerry Edelman taught us this idea at the level of the neural network. When we know that neural networks that are used are those that survive, it's just a larger scale up of the same principle Hebb discovered, I'd argue. And then B.F. Skinner actually discovered this principle at the level of behavior. He called it positive reinforcement, but he never had a, his explanation for why what it was was always circular, right? Well, that, that why was that behavior re, why was that why did that behavior occur again well because it was reinforcing well why was it reinforcing well because it occurred again and on and on and on but if we look at this gentleman here um climbing a tree to get an apple the minute he takes that apple and bites it the chemicals in that apple then feed back into the system that produced the work that let the apple grabbing the apple climbing tree climbing and the eating all happen so we have a multi-scale system of self-sustaining work. Mark Bickard in 2021 proposed that these systems are recursive. That just means that there's feedback loops across all levels. It's pretty straightforward. I've been putting these ideas together for some time now into the notion of wild systems theory because my objective is not so much causality, but the taste of ice cream, the feeling of love. And I need these things to be as real as bricks. And in most contemporary takes, multi-scale complex systems, we still end up with the taste of ice cream and the feeling of love is potentially epiphenomenal. And that's something I cannot abide. So um, self-sustaining systems alter the context in which they sustain themselves in ways that further afford sustainment. So the emergent systems give rise to new contexts. For example, the, the plethora of plants affords the emergence of herbivores, which simultaneously affords the emergence of carnivores, and then the earlier mentioned credit card companies. The point here then is that the fuel source is dictating the consumer. In other words, evolution is packing more and more constraints into the structure of beings. And interestingly enough, as I talk more like this, reality is increasingly described in terms of context instead of the concepts physical, mental, objective subjective or matter information and the evil scheme here is to use the notion of context as the foundational ontological starting point 
So here's where I start to turn all of this multi-scale complexity into meaning. Self-sustaining systems are embodiments of the context from which they emerged. So if we look at the lion chasing the zebra, everything about that lion is an embodiment of the constraints that have to be addressed to propel a mass as a whole through a context, through a gravity field to capture that fuel source, all right? They can be modeled then as internally related embodied context. And internally related is a philosophical concept uh, that contrasts with the notion of external relations. We can talk about it later, for, but those who know, know that Bertrand Russell spent a lot of time at the beginning of the 20th century trying to get rid of the notion of internal relations. Internal relations is basically the idea if A and B, if part of the relation between A and B makes up what A and B are, then A and B are internally related. So it's not A and B with an external relation between them, but actually what A and B are is somewhat constituted by their relation. Thus, embodiments of context are naturally, and these are philosophical terms, naturally and necessarily about the context that they embody. There is therefore no epistemic divide between the organism and its environment, between an embodiment of context and its context. The internal processes of an embodiment of context are naturally and necessarily meaningful because they are embodied context. They are what I'll also call embodied aboutness. So sustaining systems then, and the notion of embodied context, it avoids the notion of an epistemic gap. Well, what the hell is an epistemic gap? So I'm just going to quickly review what that might mean, because this is how we tend the epistemic gap and the notion of what is where we get the notions of um, subjective, objective, mental, physical matter information. So the epistemic gap is a story about uh, how we exist on the other side of reality. So when we talk about words like reality, we'll talk about trees, and then we'll tend to talk about impressions we have of trees, right? So we have a big reality outside of us, and we have our, our impressions of that reality within us. When we get sophisticated, we call those out there objective trees, and we call the ones inside of us subjective trees. And when we start getting really, really sophisticated, we call them observer-independent trees, and we'll call them observer-dependent trees. This way of thinking about reality has dominated Western thinking for at least 400 years, if not five or six. The point I want to make here is that Reality is described as existing on the other side of the observer. Reality is being modeled in contrast to experience. What is objective is that which is not subjective. What you mean, what that means is that the, this narrative assumption leads to the assumption that there's some kind of gap between the objective and the subjective. And then what happens is that cognitive science is tasked with finding a bridge to cross the gap. We can call it representations, or if you're, if you're an information processing theorist, call them affordances if you're an ecological psychologist. So why can't we stop believing that this epistemic gap is real? Why do we constantly, why can't we just get out of this way of thinking? Well, here's, this, here's the curse. All self-sustaining systems necessarily generate and sustain system context borders out of their work. In other words, you can't be a single cell if the border between the cell and the context isn't created by the work that is the cell. These borders are necessarily porous to afford the intake, transformation, and dissipation of energy. These system context borders generate what I'll call foundational othering. This is the emergence of a being in a flux. And in order to generate a being in a flux, energy has to be dressed some way what I'm talking about mainly today is living systems, but I'm sure when we, we talk about electrons, we'd still be talking about how energy manifests itself as a wave or a particle. However, since the border is naturally and necessarily embodies context, and this is important, since my skin naturally and necessarily embodies context, it is not an epistemic aboutness border, right? It is just as much about the context I'm embedded in as anything going on in my brain. So there's aboutness that permeates what I am, and I would argue permeate, permeates what reality is. So this thing I'm talking about, why we can't get over, why, why, we, why can't we get over thinking about the reality as objective and subjective and in and out, 
is because of the way our brains work. All right. So, for example, whenever you whenever you generate a um, a motor command, it goes to the spinal cord, muscles contract, creates effects in the world that then come back into the brain about a tenth of a second later. But one of the things that's been increasingly investigated in the last 20 years is that these same motor neurons send collaterals down to very specific locations in the cerebellum, which has five times more neurons than the cortex. The cortex is incredibly overrepresented or hyperrepresented in the cerebellum. Now, these cerebellar neurons are also receiving afferents from the limb that was commanded to move. So what we have going on in the cerebellum, if you like, is a generation of command feedback regularities. And what this means is these neurons, then that are receiving commands and feedback, actually recurse back onto the motor neurons that prime them in the first place. This loop takes 10 milliseconds. This loop explains why Jimmy Page can play 20 notes a second if he wants to. Because by the time he's planning to play the third note, the fourth and fifth note are primed in memory and they're already coming, priming his motor cortex well outside the levels of conscious awareness. His consciousness is there to make sure nothing else influences what he's doing, not to control what his fingers are doing. So different researchers have tapped into this. Anticipatory motor error is what roboticist Colato calls it. Virtual feedback is what Andy Clark called it. And dynamic state estimation is what biologist um, Paulin called it. Um, basically, we're talking about recursion, what some want to call anticipation. I used to call verbal or virtual. Some people will call it estimation. But the clear is, is our memories are constantly priming our cortex such that we're living in this anticipatory unconscious bubble that we don't even feel ourselves generating. These bubbles are borders, okay? So these concepts, they all refer to stories or bubbles told about our feet. They're about the foot's future. They're based on what the foot's done in the past. We're generating them all the time until we're surprised. For example, when you're talking to your friend about that last episode of The Last of Us and how much you loved it, not while you're walking down the stairs, and then suddenly you step out to the last step, you realize you haven't reached yet, and you fall. You weren't consciously aware of how your foot was landing on this exact point and the exact stair every time because you were running on memory. And foot stories, the past primes of present is an anticipation about the future. So my point is, data now in the last 20 years indicate that every, almost every aspect, if not every aspect of the cortex shares these recursive couplings with the cerebellum. That means that every single time you think, act, plan, you're priming yourself with what should come next based on what you've done before. The past is constantly priming the present as an anticipation about the future. All right. So we live in multiple scales of anticipation and storytelling all the time, and we're not aware until we're surprised. So we tell stories about our bodies all the time, um, stories about our relationship to the world. How do I keep to the center of the path? Stories about future body world. Is this the right way to the lake? Stories about abstract world. I wonder what this forest would be like in 100 years. Because these stories develop spontaneously out of your live life, they're wild stories. There's stories about how you have moved your body and your perceptions and your ideas over the course of your life. And you live in them constantly. And they're there for very clear function. I'm going to skip this slide. <clears throat> I'm going to skip that slide. Um, we generate them so that we can tell our thoughts, perceptions, and actions from others. Great study here, one of my favorite in the last 20 years, a, a, um, a chickadee, a, a a young chickadee listens to a father sing a song. It uses its mirror neuron. So basically when this father sings, it's priming the baby to sing. Baby sings. After a bit of that gets burnt into the baby's nervous system, its own nervous system starts to inhibit the influence of the father. Completely outside of conscious control. Why? Because this allows this being to differentiate its condition from other beings that it's surrounded, other conspecifics. This lets us, in effect, be someone. If we don't have these borders, we start to we become able to tickle ourselves, like, um, for like for example, schizophrenics can. We start hearing we start hearing hallucin we start seeing hallucinations and having delusions because we're generating thoughts, experiences, and we're not tracking them as if we're doing them ourselves. So self-sustaining embodied contexts avoid the notion of epistemic gap, meaning phenomenology and consciousness are the natural necessary aboutness of which all embodied contexts are constituted. The notion of embodied context is consistent with Spinoza's notion of God 
is infinite nature and humans is finite aspects or finite embodiments of that nature. By describing persons as being nested within reality versus on the other side of it, wild systems theory conceptualizes organisms as embodiments of context. Such embodiments are naturally necessary. I'm kind of reviewing here. They are embodied aboutness. We are meaning. Meaning is not something we create. Meaning is something we are and something we manage. Well, I'm going to end on another quote from Sebald and a quote about the curse of believing our borders. Because when we generate our symbols and our notes about what's outside of us in practices such as art and science and politics, we can't escape the curse. We have to do these things. Yet at the same time, when we believe that those are more real than our being and we believe in epistemic gaps, there are things we say and do that put our being at risk. So in our office, where there were such quantities of lecture notes, letters, and other documents lying around, that it was like standing amidst a flood of paper. On the desk, which was both the origin of the focal point of this amazing profusion of paper, a virtual paper landscape had come into being in the course of time, with mountains and valleys, like a glacier when it reaches the sea, it had broken off at the edges and established new deposits all around on the floor, which in turn were advancing imperceptibly toward the center of the room. This is some of my remarks about Sabal. Paper upon paper, word upon word, all of it necessary, all of it abstraction, all of it forever incomplete. Now, instead of encountering such revelation with despair, wild systems theory encourages us to experience it as an invitation to an ambiguous, holist, grounded state of being that affords a form of creative possibility attainable in no other way. Everything is about everything. Nothing is about itself. Such a state frees us from the constraints enforced by rhetorical systems that do not experience themselves as creations. Within such a space, we can freely combine the creations of different disciplines in ways that perhaps violate the rules of their rhetoric while potentially nibbling away at their boundaries. We can walk across the sensed otherness of our own words, knowing full well that doing so is the very means by which we create new ones. And when we begin our meditations on the nature of knowledge from the feeling of live life and ensure we never abstract so far away from it that we forget where we started, we keep it real, we keep it connected, we keep it as well as our understandings of ourselves, whole. Situated in this grounded space, we can then write and think as if we're sitting on the very top of the ivory tower, all the while knowing and feeling the very earth and work upon which the ivory tower was built. This, I think, is the essence of wild systems theory. Thank you. Hmm. Oh, you, let me let me stop sharing my screen here. I don't think I went over time. You did not go over time. Okay. Uh, in fact, we definitely have time for questions, but let me first say uh, thank you for that. My embodied oh, context you. is resonating. <laughs> um, well, thank you. Uh, uh, let's see if there are any questions. Uh, if there are, I know there's going to be a lot of potential threading uh, between mm. uh, this system. And so if none are jumping out, I think there's going to be a lot of opportunity for uh, discussion. Uh, if Rich is ready, um, uh, then why don't we go on over to Rich? And I've written a, a number of notes uh, that I want to weave things together, but I would like to get Rich and read up here, and then we can really uh, see about developing that dance. Uh, Rich? Yeah, I am ready. You can hear me, hopefully. Um, Greg, it's really brilliant the way you have uh, uh, cu curated this. Uh, it's uh, That was really beautiful, Scott, and, and Tyler, too. Just you've you've woven this path that has, <laughs> it's this beautiful setup for a talk, uh, a, a different talk than the one I came with, but still I'm going to, so what I'm going to do is try to, I'm going to try to wing it on the fly and weave back in the, the pattern that I think y you've generated here. So, but, uh, so we'll see how this goes. Uh, let me share my screen. This one here. Uh, let's see. I can't get it to go to full screen. Maybe I can if I do that. Is that is that full screen for everybody? It's full screen. Okay, okay good. 
Uh, all right. So, and by the way, Greg, I also just wanted to first say thanks to you because you know, I, I'm sure a lot of us know this already, but your contribution to this field and to this community is, uh, it's just been amazing. And I can speak from personal experience that you, you know, you've helped me in ways that you, you don't even know. And, um, and not only that, I, I, I think your interpretation of the big history narrative is is probably one of the most consistent with the data. So I I just I just want to give a shout out to you, Greg, for all that you do. It really is deep gratitude, man. Deep deep appreciation. Thank you, sir. Sure. Um, so let's see. Um, so in this talk, uh, the idea is that I'm going to introduce this idea of Oika to you, uh, and I'm going to propose that how I I think it can extend the vision of big history, which is what you know the, the title of this panel is. But I also um, want to show how I think it might resolve a meaning gap, which I want to differentiate from your enlightenment gap and also from Scott's epistemic gap. Um, uh, and I also explain how Oika creates the potential for enhanced amelioration, not only of the meaning crisis, but also of the, 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 the maladies that we collectively refer to as the Anthropocene, which really represent an existential issue. And if we don't get this one right, if we don't get these this relationship to the planet, right? Any conversation about wisdom is pre is, is pretty much moot. So what um, I'm, 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 I just want to say that up front that what this is about is really in response to what we've you know come to know as the meaning crisis, uh, and I'm and I'm framing it that way because I think that this conference, this community cares deeply about meaning. Um, but I think that this, what we call the meaning crisis and what we call the Anthropocene are basically the same problem. They're at least rooted in the same, in the same disconnect. Um, and, and when I say disconnect, I mean disconnect from the world. And when I say world, I mean this world. But I wanna start this with just to outline a couple of uh, conceits. And the first one is that we're here gathered to explore the contours and to develop uh, sources of wisdom. Uh, and so I wanna acknowledge that. And I also wanna acknowledge that for many here, that means that we should be looking to the mind for that, for that wisdom. And I think that's right. And, and many in this community think we should be using things like philosophy as the access to the mind that can provide that wisdom. And I also wanna just, give a nod to the conceit that we're here to find consilience, consilience among separate lines of inquiry that can come together and help us to generate that wisdom. And I wanna do this in the context of this space. When I say this space, I kind of mean the little corner of the internet. And I wanna actually just stop for one second and say, this talk is geared primarily to highlight and to surface what I see as a problem. But what I'm realizing when I'm in this room with this group of people right now, this particular session, <laughs> we're not the problem. The people in this room are, for the, by and large, digging deep into the intelligence of nature and surfacing it and bringing it to the fore for us to use in this quest for wisdom. So I just want to make that clear that I'm, I'm not actually talking about this specific subset of this community, but I am talking about the community at large. So what do I see as an observer of this space? I see, I hear a lot of people talking about grounding the mind in science and nature. That's good. I see people rigorously engaging with the historical products of some superb human intelligences that have showed up on this earth. Intelligences and, and competencies in the skills of rationalization. That's good. I see people faithfully submitting to ancient spiritual traditions and some new ones. And I see people finding great solace and guidance in these practices and tradition. That's good. I see people using nature to better understand the dynamics of their bodies and even perception. That's good. There are people out there in the woods doing things. And that's good. I see people taking deep dives into interpersonal spaces. And in doing so, that surfaces new affections, new affinities, and new sensitivities that they didn't know they had. That's good. I see uh, people beginning to plumb the depths of big histories in ways that shed new light on all of this that I just mentioned. So these are all very exciting things. But I also think that there's a problem. I talked about those things. The problem. Um, and the problem is that I see a profound disorient, disordering, an inversion 
in how we actually look directly to nature for the kinds of insights that can ground this emergent, consilient wisdom that we're all after. It's an inverted condition. If I were to come up with a word, it's about where's the nature. If I were to come up with a with a with a meme, it would be that we that many of us in this community have our cart before our horse. And when I say horse, I really mean that's nature. That we've we've and this will become this will become clearer as I go through this. But again, I want to just I just want to emphasize that it's really not the people in this room, and I'm realizing that now. So to do this, I want to take a quick look at this very complicated uh, graphic. This is Benita Roy's Origins of the Self-Talk. There's no way I don't have the time or the expertise to really flesh out all the details in the way that she does it. So I really encourage people to find this talk. It's called The Origins of the Self. She did it on the STOA and she walks you through this whole thing. And it's just, when I saw this, it was just brilliant because it, because it laid out in no uncertain terms the problem that I'm also dealing with. Which is a, uh, a which is a gap in in, in that, that happens along this. So what I'm going to do is simplify this, and just take her three axes here, and point out that on her x-axis, this is some this refers to a kind of psychological development of the human. So that x-axis from the origin point refers to the kind of the lifetime of a human and how we evolve psychologically over time in a lifetime. On the y-axis, these are all again. This is just really, you know broad broadly stated there's a lot of detail that goes on to this we have things that like depth psychology deep culture and all the way down to the deep natural intelligences that we're going to be talking about she also has a z axis here which is the the show up or congruency axis i'm going to let rita talk a little bit more about that her talks more about what that z axis is about so what i'm going to do is just real quickly go over her model here it starts at the middle at the beginning here this is the day of your birth you're born and your way of sort of dealing and 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 in a sense of connecting with the community around you is as a, as a mind as being of mind because all you've got is your body to deal with your your a mind and then you evolve you know through your relationships into a me and then more to an i and as you go through life you learn how to have relationships with other people you can develop a we sensibility an us sense of belonging an all of us sense of belonging all beings all entities all earth cosmos that's the idea here is that these are these broadening circles of belonging along this X axis to infinity. Now, the way she maps this out is that she starts that the mind become, because you have this relationship with your body, my hand is the thing you start to deal with. And, and then you have my mother. And then that results in the way you show up in the world as a me. Now, I'm going to stop for one second and just say that in Bonnie's um um, explication here she basically says that this is the this is the level to which the like western modern american uh identity has gotten to me which is a real sad state of affairs but we could go further we could go you know internal family systems to the eye we can start to then have you know cultural relationships and develop a sense of the we and she calls this like the the gold standard of organizational development matters to find these we spaces which are all the rage. And if we go deeper, we can draw on the, the, the mythos of the past to become an us. But I'm going to stop here because there's something that happens. And, and this is the problem, is this not? What this not represents is what I, what I think of as all of the historical baggage that our consciousness and our identities inherit from the past. Think about every Every religious conquest, every war, every, you know, every stupid ideology that's come down the pike, we've inherited something from that. And it's started to really confuse and to complicate, to, to overly complicate our perceptions of what it means to be, what the mind is. And this is what I'm seeing as the problem. And I, and I represent it here as just kind of like a big tangle, a big knot. This is what's keeping us from getting into those deeper realms of intelligence that big history is plumbing, that pl big, big history plumbs these, but we're not getting there because we're getting stuck in these. You could put lots of things in this knot. You could put Socrates, you could put Muhammad, you could put the Kabbalah, you could put um, Gnosticism, you could put, you know, there's a lot of things that are contributing to the, to the noise that keeps us from 
accessing deep natural intelligences. Bonita puts it this way, the more you can awaken to these lower structures, the easier it is for you to authentically embrace the next larger structure. That's how it works. You have to do due diligence in the deeper universals to authentically embrace the larger collective. I think this is what Oika does. Oika operates down there in the in those regions of intelligence, natural intelligence. So we we deal with the animal realm, and then and then I, I, what Oika does as a course is it teaches about the history of the universe. It tells the story in in a in a very sort of relational and integral way. We talk about biotic realms, abiotic realms, how life started. We talk about planetary systems. We talk about the cosmos, all the way back to the mystery before time. This is the these are the this is the content of a big history. And when you do that, you open up access to all of these bigger uh, uh, senses of belonging that that uh, that are out there on the x axis waiting to be had. So Oika, in some ways, will untangle that knot and open up access to these things. So this is the argument. Um, and I just want to give you a quick little uh, example, something that's hot on you know hot. It, right now in our conversations uh, are the work of Michael Levin, his work with, you know, xenobots and planaria showing us about all these new ways in which animals communicate through bioelectricity and like gap junction. So this is one of the areas things, this is the things that, that, that um, Oika teaches about bioelectricity, xenobots, gap junctions. I mean, talk about a source for intelligence. If we can really understand and um, begin to, um, integrate what gap junctions are telling us about the way we are communicating with each other and the way that these systems are ecosystems. It's just, this is the intelligence that's, that's, that's on hand and ready to be integrated into this new consilient wisdom. Uh, and one of his ideas about cognitive light cones, and this is how we get to the Bodhisattva's vow, is that he says, if you can tell me what you if you tell me what you care about, I'll tell you what kind of an organism you are. And so these, I just found it really fascinating that his idea of the cognitive light cones map extraordinarily well to this sort of expanding sense of belonging. These, and and that's how we get to the bodhisattva's vow. Because if you remember, the bodhisattva's vow is to, you know, delay enlightenment, you know, in the service of all sentient beings. That's really what we're talking about. And I think you know. Hopefully you can see how this all kind of relates back to the to the meaning crisis. But what I want to do now is just show you real quick um, how Oika works. So Oika takes this story of the universe. Here it is as a spiral, and you know I I, I break it into conceptual pieces, starting with the Big Bang, the cosmic microwave background radiation, and the formation of stars, and just tell the story as as we know it. And what we do is to bring these intelligences down into this model. So you can see here that as we go through one of these courses, I'm mapping stories from the, the, the cosmic narratives, like for here, like the, the origins of the earth, bringing it down in here and making it available to this, to this psychological development trajectory of the human. So this is just how it works. And here's something that, this is the thing that I think is really fascinating, something that I've, I've witnessed happen so if we take this model, this X, Y axis model, and we tell the story of the universe, what ends up happening is that this new continuity is revealed. Actually, it's not two axes, it's the same axes. Our personal psychological developmental trajectory is really just an extension, a continuity of the universe's continuity uh, trajectory. So I think that that's, that's that's it's just an important aspect of what Oika does. Now, I was in on the 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 the, the spiritual um, I forget what it was called the spiritual dimensions of this work, and I wanted to just now get back to this problematization that I was talking about. This is just a visualization. It's a way of thinking about what the problem that I'm proposing is. We take this. I create this circle, and the outer ring of this circle, that blue line. Let's just say for the sake of argument, say that that represents God, cosmos, nature, logo, spirit, source, whatever, however you, the elephant's on God. It could be whatever it is that you, you know, you want that. And let's also assume that it's, it's part of the human um, endeavor to kind of commune with that, to kind of feel connected to it. And then what I've done is in the background there, there's this blue uh, gradient, and I've been calling it the divine blue fog. 
And the idea here is that if we map Bonita's model into this system, you see that when the, you know, when the infant is born, it's bathed in this divine blue light. It's, you know, we can just pretend that it's, that it's, that it's in touch with God when it's born. But then as you go through life, we arrive at this, this spot at this, at this uh, blockage. And in the background, you'll see that the divine blue light has sort of faded. It's become more diffuse and something what I, this is what I see happening in this community. I, I, I see it a lot. I see it all over the internet. You know, these big names that we're that we're that we're dealing with. Uh, these, uh, this thing that happens where you depart, you jump ship from this trajectory, and you head straight for the whatever it is you're got. You head straight for the God, for the logos. But what ends up happening is you, because you've sort of interrupted this this thing, you've got all this momentum, and you bonk into this thing bounce off of it, go ricocheting away. You haven't actually communed with it. You've just gone off. And so I've got two loop-to-loops there. And, and I just want to real quickly sort of put the problem into one of those loop-to-loops. If, if you spend a lot of time in nature and the only thing that you can see nature is as, you know, that how your body and nature are in, how nature helps shape your body, that's a kind of reciprocal spiral loop there. You don't actually see the origin of your body. You just see how it shapes your current view of reality. The second loop to loop might be thought of more as an intellectual reciprocal narrowing where, and I see this a lot, that you've got all these conceptual ideas and you've got all these intellectual machinations that you can call upon, but, but still, it, you're not including the deep, deep intelligence. See, that's the problem here is that this system never gets down into the deep intelligences, the deep structural intelligence of the universe. This is what I call the cart before the horse state. That seems like there's a lot of this going on. So I just want to now project that same system onto this system, but instead bring Oika into the picture, teach about those deep natural intelligences, let the spiral expand all the way out to, and then you see at the end there, when you get out into these outer reaches of a sense of belonging, lo and behold, you've actually come into contact with that thing that you were searching for. But in the previous case, you don't get there. In this, this, so I'm trying to make an argument that we're not doing enough down there. I see it happening in this, you know, in this session, I see this working, but generally speaking, I don't. And this is what I just call um, the the um, the Trojan horse, you know, aspect of it. We, we need to bring Oika into culture so that we have more of this. So this is just a quick snapshot of of what an Oika course looks like. I won't go into it now, but you can see here, like in fact, there's one column there that refers to the story of nature. That's where we actually tell the big history narrative. In that thing, we tell the whole story of it. And in each case, we're bringing all of these concepts that come out of this work into this personal psychological development. But what you'll also see are like over on the left there, these are all earth stories. These are people who are, and myself included, that are actually engaging with the natural world. Because what I'm seeing, as I was listening to Scott talk about, and, and also Tyler, you, when when they were talking, I could, I, I, I you're talking about these things in a sort of conceptual intellectual way, but there's a phenomenology that's associated with all this. There's a part of me that's like, of course, these things make perfect sense because you can feel them when you're in the world, when you're engaging with the natural world, all of these concepts are perfectly clear. We just somehow have gotten confused and distracted from, from being able to elegantly bring these things into into consciousness and into the wisdom commons that we're trying to create. So just to, to just to um, to summarize here, Oika is the intel. It refers to the intelligence of nature. It is a relational intelligence. It's all the dynamism of religion. This is why my me as an ecologist. That's why it makes sense to me. I look at everything in terms of the relationships. It cleanly and seriously integrates the big history narrative, which, which I think is what. Uh, sets it up to be uh, part of the new vision for big history. Oika can be felt and communicated and learned and taught by humans. In fact, it needs to be if we're going to address the meaning crisis. And, and here's just one last thing I want to leave you with. Of course, we understand how something like Michael Levin's work can bring new intelligence to the to the construction of wisdom. But what 
but, but what the phenomenology of Wojka is doing is it's getting us out of those frames, those confused and complicated frames, bringing us back down into the mud with the worms, with the animals, with the, even the molecules, even the chemistry. And it gives you a different perspective to try and untangle the knot from down below as opposed to from above. I see a lot of us using the gifts of, of, of complex thinking and cognition to try and untangle the knot. But if you go down there into the depths, you get equipped with this Occam's razor and you come back up to that problem from below and you can snip away a lot of the complications that come with, that come, come, come with packaged to us from the accidents of history. And finally, that a culture that is infused with Oika can heal places, it can heal people, it can heal planet, it can resolve the the, the, the meaning crisis, and it can get us to back away from this ecological cliff that we have, that, we, that we've pushed ourselves toward. So yeah, I guess that's it. I'm not sure what my timing was, but I really look forward to some more conversation going on here. So thank you very much. Great, uh, very good. Rich, you can stop sharing your screen. That's wonderful, thank you. All right. Um, one thing I will, because it came up in the chat a little bit, um, could you say a little bit more just about the word oika and sort of what the kind of direct meaning references are? And uh, that that came up a bit uh, in two questions. Uh, so that might be a useful, uh, sure, just quick question. Sure, it comes from the Greek word oikos, uh, which you may recall is the origin of the of the prefix eco. So the term eco comes from, so ecology comes from oikos and so does economy. But uh, it refers to, in the Greek conception, it refers to home, which is three part concept. Home meaning person, which meant the man of the house, place, which meant the house and property. So that's the Greek conception so, and it's oikos, it's masculine. So what I did was to just feminize the word to oika and, and instead of it just being person, place, and property. And by the way, like property meant the, the wife, the kids, the slaves, as well as the furniture in the house. By feminizing it, I make it more expansive, more inclusive. And it goes from, it means person as in the human being or the, the being, place meaning the home, that could be the watershed, the mountain range, the valley, the neighborhood, person, place, practice. So how do we, what are those practices that we do to, 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 to couple person to place. And then instead of property, it's um, prosperity. So that there's a, there's a, there's a, op, there's a opportunity to prosper in, built into the, the concept of Oika. Hope that helps. Okay. Lovely. Um, if you would like, we can go do one that we can, we do have maybe five minutes for questions or we can go into Rita and then we can, I don't see any immediately jumping. Oh, those are the two that I definitely want to. Um, so given that, why don't we uh, uh, go to Rita and then I'm taking questions uh, for us uh, and then we will uh, shift into that. So uh, Rita, uh, please uh, pick up the Oika ball and help us participate. <laughs> uh, yeah, Oika ball, big history ball. Let's do it. <laughs> All right. Okay. I'm going to, hopefully this works. I always get paranoid. Okay, I think you can see my presentation, but not my notes. Is that correct? That is. Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. Okay. Thank you, Rich. Thank you, Scott and Tyler. And thank you very much, Greg. Um, this is just a very awesome space that you've created in these past two days, Greg. And I know it took a lot of work and I appreciate the work on your behalf and the work that everybody else is contributing, the speakers and the audience and everybody. So thank you. I'm very happy to be here. I'm very surprised to be here. I'm not a big historian. I am Rita LeDuc and I'm an artist and I've been collaborating with Oika for a couple of years now. So I'm here to offer a practical accompaniment of the how of Oika or how deep natural intelligence extends ecological wisdom into culture via creativity and art. So in order to do that, I am going to characterize the phenomenon of when the wisdom of the universe expresses itself through an individual and into culture. I'm going to explore why artists seem to be pre-constituted as conduits for this work. 
And I'm going to share some examples of this wisdom dissemination from the Oika community around the world. So essentially, I'm going to describe and offer examples of ways by which the naturalization of wisdom can inspire a naturalization of culture. I'm going to show what happens when one occupies the shadow that Rich just described on Bonnie's model. I'm going to explain how once you're there, you can find and feel the continuity between the strong transcendence and the strong naturalism. This is something that Benita Roy is currently speaking about in a concurrent session right now. Um, and I think I might actually be scaling up Scott's self-sustaining work. So I think we might get a glimpse of how that's happening in culture right now. Okay, so just like big history itself, the content of Oika offers an overarching structure that's a container for any and everything. So because of continuity, because of the cosmic story, it overlays itself onto any number of personal and cultural practices. This makes it really flexible, kind of amorphous, and it might, you might find some familiarity in it. You might notice that you, that you see glimpses of it in your personal life, your professional life, your cultural practice. So what Oika does is it uses a variety of entry points to share this story in a deep way. The idea here is we wanna open and invite others into this infinite container. They're in it anyway, so we just wanna kinda of show them. Um, to do so, we offer courses, workshops, walks, talks, videos, exhibitions. So the images that you see here are a lot of the things that Oika has been doing over many, many years. Um, and these are offering entry points for ways of thinking, ways of being, ways of living, and ways of learning. They're all wonderful, but I'm here to talk about the rapid growth in the particular direction of art. Okay, so the first bullet point, how to characterize the ecological wisdom going into an individual and then going into culture. So it's this idea of filling up. So I want you to just look at that spiral. That image that Rich created has a really nice resonance of satisfaction and wholeness. I think we would all agree that it kind of emanates that. That is the feeling that happens when you infuse this big history content into your being, um, make it, bring it to the conscious realm, right? I mean, it's in us anyway. And so the natural phenomenon that follows here is that that content is so expansive and so fulfilling that it can't be contained in any one self. Um, and when I say content, I'm talking about cognitive content as well as participatory content, which we'll get to. Um, so this can happen to anyone that engages with this content, but what we're currently finding in Oika is that artists and creatives are pre-constituted towards spilling this content back out into the world. Okay, so I wanna know why this is. Um, and being an artist myself, I have some ideas. So artists are sensors and receivers. We are oriented to sense and receive. This is likely why we became artists to begin with. We notice that we're particularly good at it. That's what we do. We're also trained to deliver these ideas into culture. This is our purpose. We make, we sense, we receive, and then we make these things that we've absorbed, digestible and accessible to the world. We're also unencumbered by rules or methodology. So this is unlike science or religion or many other disciplines. In fact, the freedom to play is the job of the artist. So this gets a little tricky because with that comes a responsibility to maintain a certain amount of rigor. Um, we're kind of in charge of making our own rules. So you know, we don't have peer review, we don't have the scientific method, so that can get a little bit tricky, but it also allows us an opportunity to really play in this space. Um, and then I just wanted to note here that like, even though these three bullet points are things that I think all artists would probably agree with, it doesn't mean that all artists are, are particularly Oika inclined. So we wanna dig a little bit deeper. Okay, so Continuity. Continuity is a cornerstone of big history, a cornerstone of the Oika content. So if you think back to that spiral, this like very kind of just like an image of continuity, and you remember that container that I was talking about, that sort of infinite container that is the cosmic story that contains everything. And so what happens here is that 
all boundaries on all fractal levels start to dissolve. And these seemingly linear trajectories start to bend into circles. So science encounters spirituality, propositional maps onto participatory, and rigor is play. So this isn't to make them indiscernible, but to piece the whole back together. So this is the opposite of reductionism. So when I say why artists, to me, it's this gray space of continuity. This is the fertile ground. This is where Oika artists thrive. We can take all of these things, bring them all together and put them back together and see what that whole looks like. Okay, so now I'm gonna ask you to access your feelings a little bit. Um, feelings of the meaning crisis, feelings of the planetary predicament and feelings of your present moment. Um, you're probably feeling some degree of discomfort or despair. And I just want to acknowledge that and hold that for a moment. Um, so Oiko artists, what we have the ability to do is we're able to hold that kind of darkness, but also access a feeling counterforce that is the antidote to these feelings. And we access it via participation, participation in Oika in the cosmic story. This is the creativity of the universe that we are tapping into. Um, so when we access that feeling counterforce, what we activate is, and now I'm gonna call it Michael Levin, uh, we might call it a counterfactual. So here in my own words is what a counterfactual is. It's an impulse that leads us toward an alternative route somehow stored within us despite not ever consciously experiencing it in the first person. So an impulse that leads us toward an alternative route somehow stored within us despite not ever consciously experiencing it in the first person. This requires imagination. It requires vulnerability, play, a willingness to enter into chaos and the unknown. This requires participating in the gray space as part of the story. That is what Oika artists do. When we do that, when we access the counterforce, what happens is we all become co-authors co in this counterfactual. So again, I'm gonna borrow from Levin because I'm playing in a gray space where I can just take everything. Um, and we're linking up our gap junctions, we're scaling up our collective goals, and we're speaking on behalf of the wholer whole. Okay, so before I move on to examples, I just wanted to emphasize two important points. Number one, when we do this, when we come together as a community and we scale up our goals, the higher scale goal needs a home. So Oika provides a container for that higher scale goal. I can speak from personal experience and I know other Oika artists have had this happen to them as well. Giving artist talks, trying to explain this higher scale goal without the overarching community the ideas evaporate before they even reach the audience. Like I can just see them come out of my mouth and they like poof disappear just like which is not. Um, it's frustrating. It's also kind of fascinating. And so what I think is happening here is that the audience needs a container to hang those bigger goals on. So I can talk about my practice, I can talk about my work, but when I suddenly scale up the goal, there aren't walls big enough for the audience to hang that goal onto. And so it just disappears. And so having an overarching community of artists that are doing this work has been really, really helpful for the audience to really kind of sink their teeth into what we're trying to talk about. And then secondly, is this idea of specificity getting to universality. Again, I think if you think about that spiral, you can see how that, you can't rush it. Like it takes rigor and it takes like time. Um, and so the thing about Oika art is it's not uniform. There's not like an idea of what Oika art is supposed to look like. These are practices, principles, concepts. And so the artists come in and it slots right into their own practice. So it stays specific and lived and individualized. Yes, we find common vocabulary and the Oika concepts and the cosmic story enhance the work, enhance the practice, but the work and the practices don't become cliche or neutered or surface level. So here I'm going to call in Verveki and I'm going to say the suchness is tethered to the moreness. Okay, so it doesn't work if we just shoot straight to the moreness. If you think about Rich's arrow that just kind of shot straight out to, you know, the spiritual, it doesn't work that way. It loses teeth. 
It's not grounded. And so the specificity provides authentic and welcoming access to the universality. It's a little bit counterintuitive that individuality would yield universality, but think about a diverse and resilient ecosystem. Individual truths brought together are going to get us to a universal truth. Otherwise it's flat. So Oika artists are able to be themselves, be authentic, have authentic relationships with the world. And that's how we get to these universal truths. Okay, and then um, bringing back Benita Roy's model, um, just to kind of emphasize how not flat this is. And this is the Z axis. I've covered it up with some photos here of different Oika artists um, showing up. This is the congruency axis, it's the show up axis. And so these photos show not, not just the artists in their studio or presenting their talks or in their exhibitions, but these are photos that all the Oika artists have shared with each other when we find Oika in our lives. And so what happens is like, because of continuity, this stuff doesn't stay just in our studios or in the gallery. This stuff is like in us. And so it just oozes out everywhere all the time. And, and so this is like a natural byproduct of absorbing continuity is that we advance along the congruency axis. So, so Rich can take us down, 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 down on the Y axis to so the abiotic vibe and biotic dimensions but then we expand out via Oika concepts and participation onto that Z axis and show up sincerely. And so we're disseminating this stuff into culture from every direction. Okay, so here's some examples of what's happening internationally. Um, this is Oika Spain. Fred Adam um, has been working with Rich for like, I think over 10 years now. Um, and he found this hut, he fixed it up, he cultivated all these connections. Um, this is in Costa Blanca, Spain, and now he's in collaboration with an environmental organization. They're educating people, they're regenerating the land. There's visiting artists and residencies happening, Oika workshops and encounters, art exhibitions, installations, virtual programming and projects. Fred is a genius and a gem, and if you're ever in Spain, you should check this place out. I haven't been there yet, but I, I hope to soon. Okay. Um, Geert Vermeer is in Greece. He's a curator and a poet. And um, Oika Expedition Zagori happened this past year as the pilot program. It's in collaboration with the Eco Museum Zagori and University of Ionina. Again, there's artist residencies. The, um, the pilot year was Vicky Virgo, Ida Larson, and Annie Rapstoff, and they created a beautiful publication. It's available on the Oika website. It's free, you just so PDF. Um, workshops, seminars, yeah, publications, and now there's a satellite collective in the UK. I don't know if there's like a delay here. I don't know what's happening. It's not changing, right? Uh, make sure your uh, uh, pointer is not over the, where the, like the visit. There we go. Thank you, Greg. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, Oika Expedition Nantucket. Another pilot project happening in collaboration with Mariah Mitchell. This is gonna be opening this June. So if you're on Nantucket, please stop by. There'll be an indoor art exhibition, outdoor installations and performances, talks, workshops. Rich has already interviewed all of the artists on the Nature of Nantucket podcast. And what he's doing is he's kind of cycling through so that people can listen and hear the project unfold in real time. Um, and then we're gonna be offering Oika for Earthling courses and Oika for artist courses. If anybody's interested in that, they are hybrid. You don't have to be on Nantucket, so you can reach out to me or Rich. Okay. Um, Oika collaboration at the Hubbardbrook Experimental Forest. This is called Ecology Extended. This is between Rich and myself. We started this in 2021. Um, so it's already had kind of a lot of, it's gone a lot of places. It's gone to the UK at a workshop. Um, we're also, what's cool about this one is we're engaging very much so with the natural sciences, the hard sciences, uh, long-term ecological research network and the organization of biological field stations. So there's, I don't, there's a, some art sci, there's a movement happening in the art world towards this art sci collaboration. And so we're kind of trying to move the needle in that realm, which is hard work, but also really fun. And then there's an Oika film, which is happening in collaboration with Lost Lake Productions. Um, it's a lot of what you've heard about today, what we're talking about, but we're trying to make it visually stimulating and accessible to a wider audience. Okay, so 
what did we do today? Why am I here at this big history talk? Um, I'm here to characterize how Oika extends wisdom into the individual and into culture. So hopefully I did that. I wanted to explore, explore why artists, and I wanted to share some examples. So what is the new vision for big history? Where do we go for wisdom? So again, I'm not a big historian, but I believe the new vision for big history is this. And this. And this. And as for wisdom, the Oika community is going here. And here. And here. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, wow. That was uh, beautiful. Um, let me take a second. Uh, so in 20, October, late October, 2020, as I've told people, I had a little transcendental moment, actually it lasted a couple of weeks, <laughs> um, that I ended up labeling wisdom energy. <laughs> and in a core quote, uh, or that cat now caps for you talk sort of mission is, cultivate wisdom energy. Uh, those are the two axes, uh, and, or three, uh, basically. The bottom axis and the other axis, and, and the unity and the homing of that axis is what I experienced in essence. Um, I experienced self as context. Um, I experienced the combo genesis of the universe in relation. That's, that's, that was the fundamental embodied felt sense. And that's what I ended up giving the words wisdom energy to. Um, so uh, the, the speaking of that, at least for me, the resonance across the, the presentations that we saw today was actually, um, well, touching to say it in the embodied sense of the word. So thank you all for that. I was, uh, I was excited coming in and now moved uh, as we sit in this space. So. Um, I'll offer that. Um, uh, maybe we can transition then into some questions. How about we, if there's any other brief reflections that anybody wants to offer from the panel, and then I'll just open up. We have till 1230. I'll open us up uh, for questions. Any other? I have a question for you, Greg. Mm -hmm. Did you, is this, was this by design that, that you sort of brought us along this? this or did it just happen that way that we started um it certainly isn't it certainly wasn't uh a, a, a tight predictive process <laughs> um uh but it certainly at the same time it, it's a it's an intuitive sense that there was potential lines to be threaded for sure and i hope i, I think it just captured something really expansive you know that it, it, so I just thought it was brilliant. Well, right. I, I mean, that's a moment when I saw your thing, and I'd seen Bonnie at Benita's Roy, uh, Benita Roy, and we actually we talked a, about that talk, and and we started to align, and then I did not certainly seen the energy wisdom axis, and experiencing the energy wisdom axis in a combo genesis wild system sort of way was mm. not um, what I set out to do but it was a pre it's a pretty golden thread i'll say that for at least as i experience it currently so that's cool <laughs> yeah that's cool yeah. i think it definitely manifested a kind of continuity in in itself and it was it it, it exemplified auto autocatalysis really i you know it you can just and, and fractality of it all. It just somehow it all showed up. 
<laughs> which is really cool to see. Let's party it up. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Woohoo. Uh, okay, we have a, um, yeah, so great. All right, let's have the conversation. A lot of questions in the thing, but I'll, uh, Michael Lennon, uh, I see your hand raised. And uh, if you want to go ahead and unmute yourself, if you're already, oh, go ahead. Yeah. So first of all, let me um, say, wow, um, I, I arrived, I'm, I'm just arriving into this community in this space, and I, I arrived in the middle of Rich's presentation towards the end. So, so I am completely uh, lacking in the vocabulary, only saw certain things, and I'm stunned. And um, I mean, I'm <laughs> like a moved stunned. And, um, and I know Part of the reason I decided to raise my hand is because sometimes the very act of engaging and whether whether you're the expert or the beginner, the 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 getting the in betweening going was is 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 part of I, I want to be the example of 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 the dumb one in the room, <laughs> okay. which is not usually the role I play, just to to create space for all of us to 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 play, and um, and to say uh, that it was kind of like listening to the first few notes of a Mozart concert and you recognize there's something transcendent and, and you want to hear more and go, but, uh, but uh, you realize that it stopped. You just caught the end. So, um, so I just, I just want to thank you for that, that this kind of disorienting experience that I'm having and, uh, and, um, and how beautiful it, it was to, to listen to, to 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 you, Richard, and then Rita, you sing that song in a in in, in the artist way, in a sense, and um, and uh, that I that I am a teacher, and that I've been looking to speak about how do groups co inquire into complexity and call each other back as as our as as our psyche pulls us in different directions, as our as our you know how do we how do we uh, navigate the messiness of it while while trusting that there's a way through and forward in unity and i just I, that's kind of what i heard in your in your in your song and i, I and i hope to be able to sing it uh, or sing with it soon soon enough so i know i was all over the place there but thank you only rich rita you want to comment on that okay well, i'm glad Thank you, Michael. Yeah. Very appreciate appreciated. I, I wish you had been there for the first half too, because it it really <laughs> tied the whole room together. You know, it was really cool how that how that worked. But uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Tyler. So I I wanted to um, bring up something with Scott. So I really liked your um, idea of uh, evolution bringing the context into the organism in some way. And, and actually your, your statement about, um, about, the, about the fuel, or, or, or see, what do you say about the, um, you fuel know, the source food. dictates the consumer. Yeah, um, I mean, that can apply to, you know, human culture too, with, you know, oil or different kinds of energy systems, because you were bringing that up at the beginning. But at the same time, so I guess, for, and so I'm I'm totally with the the evolution. So, since nothing is isolated, there's going to be a relationship always going on, and anything above the prokaryotic cell needs needs food or needs nutrients and needs to put out waste. So eukaryotic cells, multicellular organisms, animal societies, um, you know, hunter gatherer groups, because they're all based upon biology cells that um, not not saying they're reduced to them, but they all require um, material and energy fluxes, and, inf and some of that material energy fluxes served as is serving as information. But at the same time, the there's a difference that does happen in evolution. So a, a membrane is formed, a skin is formed, um, uh, a, a, um, a society's a, a hunter gatherer group can have a certain language uh, border to it, or maybe just more, maybe just markers, maybe the way uh, a shell necklace is made. So how in your mind are you reconciling the, the mapping of the context in evo through evolution with the creation of difference at the same time, creation of distinction, which you did bring up about the, with, with, the, with the bird song so well? 
Well, first of all, thank you uh, very much for the question. Um, if we conceptualize ourselves as self-sustaining embodiments of context, then it follows that different contexts are going to give rise to different types of embodiments. Um, living in different ecologies is going to bring about different ways of being together. Um, I was struck by uh, Rita's last couple of images because those are images of indigenous practices. Those are people living in a context that we tend to call nature. I would argue cities are nature as well and ask why we make that distinction. But nonetheless, there's a way of being that 80% of the world's population tends to live in. And it's not uh, the Christian view of uh, a realm of non-contingency called heaven, which we've replaced with the notion of information. We can talk about that if you want. But we're going to expect different different forms of aboutness to emerge as different collections of humans sustains themselves sustains them sustain themselves in different contexts in different ways. And um, yeah, you can all, well. I'll, I, I'll I'll see if that was an answer to your question, and I'll stop. Yeah. But the, so that's looking to the future. That um, um, thinking about the different contexts are going to mean different. Um, social system social and mental systems i mean there's been a lot of that at this at this conference so far in terms of um you know cultivating um you know your context of collaboration for example that that changes yeah. people's individually yeah great well one thing i think we gain a way of thinking we gain when we think of ourselves as entropy energy systems is that none of us can escape the destruction our being necessarily generates in reality there's a whole bunch of dead carrots on the planet because of us. There's a whole bunch of dead chickens, dead pigs, dead trees. All of this has been reorganized and um, broken down in the name of sustaining our way of being. Now, that's the curse of being a living being. You can't not, you know, intake, transform, and dissipate energy. So this then leads us to believe, okay, the situation we're in now, we call it the wisdom crisis. We call it... Um, you know, an environmental crisis. If we look at ourselves as energy systems, we're trying, to, we're not even really trying, but there are 8 billion versions of us across the planet extracting incredible amounts of energy from the context in which they persist in order to sustain themselves. What we might, in a sense, be kind of doing is reaching a limit of the amount of energy we can extract without our dissipation, so toxifying the environment that it, we actually end up deconstructing the environment that affords our, our sustainment, our ability to reproduce ourselves, let alone our ability to persist. So um, I like looking at it that way um, because we don't get to escape the curse of being. We are Shiva, we are creators and destroyers. And um, how then are we going to manage the suffering that our being necessarily generates? And then the issue of values becomes different. First, instead of right and wrong in some sort of moral abstract space, it's how are we going to model ourselves? How are we going to generate phenomena in the world that we end up respecting? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what we tend to find when we follow that question far enough is we end up respecting ourselves more when we tend to be living for larger contexts, more people, more systems, and embedding ourselves that way tends to lead to deeper levels of self-respect, different, different, different levels of embeddedness. So mm -hmm. that's the, I, I converge with you guys coming from this energy perspective. Um, yeah, th thanks. Uh, uh, and, um, and so that that's the the, uh, the the extended mind that our 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 impacts are coming back to us because they're in a closed uh, biosphere. And if we want to go the other direction, that. Uh, Rich and uh, Rita were talking about. I'm I'm curious to ask them something about the, uh, the especially Rich's um, focus on going inward, going downward into in, in, into mud, uh, into chemistry, into the gap junctions. So I, I'm I'm curious, you know, what what that sort of means because I my my first reaction to going into the gap junctions is that it doesn't really matter to my upper level consciousness and linguistic uh, communications with people, what the gap junctions are doing or thinking, obviously they have to be working and I might, without them being there, we would not exist. So I agree, but I, I took from your talk that you're saying that somehow we can tap into something in the gap junction 
that is more than our, our, under, our neuroscience understanding of the gap junctions, which informs us as big history livers of who we are in the cosmic context, but I'm, I'm sensing from you something more that there, there might be, are you saying that there's a way to put your consciousness down into the, the consciousness of self down into the gap junctions and gain some kind of wisdom from them? I'd like, yeah, I'm curious to, if you could clarify that. <laughs> Sounds like a trick question. Well, I, it's it, a I, I do, I do have a side, I do have a skeptical side here. Yeah, yeah, me too. Me too. D d let's not forget, I was trained in the sciences as well. That's my, you know, I went through that grist mill and I come to this with that, that kind of skepticism as well. And I'm no, I'm not necessarily claiming that we can project our consciousness down into the gap junctions. But you also have to remember that Michael Levin, who none of us could sort of, none of us can um, 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 attack his uh, empiricism and his scientific bona fides. He Agreed. talks about how all science is a metaphor that to, to you know you have to there's a there's a deep act of rejecting the hubris that comes with science that we have to say actually this is these are this is all metaphorical where we, and so and once you cross that 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 gap that hu hubristic gap uh you have a different view of things but but so no, I'm not but saying that. Does that lead you into the into some of what the yesterday was being discussed that some people in this conference want to get away from? Because that that sounds to almost like a postmodernism thing, where well, it's all metaphorical, and uh, one yeah, that well, but, yeah, that's postmodernism without the deep intelligence. That's the postmodernism that we've inherited from people who didn't know about the cosmic microwave background radiation and what it meant. They didn't know what a phospholipid bilayer did. They don't know what what the what the trilobites taught us on on how sensory motor and muscles use the um, electrolyte nature of seawater to conduct electrical signals. Yeah, you know, the point is a lot. Now you of don't seem to be talking metaphorically. Not, I mean, not, I mean, you're pretty grounded in what you're all saying. You're just saying now. I'm saying that there are ways. Well, first of all, I'm saying that there's just straight up intelligence on how to how to manage and organize and coordinate. You know. So a sustainable and 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 you know minimize suffering at the scale of human culture. But I'm also saying that spending time in contemplation of these concepts, spending time with the science and seeing it as part of the big arc that big history presents, yeah. then there's a kind of empathy, there's a kind of perspective, there's an aspect that you get on the story. There's an aspect that you get on the situation yeah. that you don't get when you when you come from above, when you come from yeah. the top, you look at this mess from yeah. above. Whereas if you spend time down with the planaria and try mm -hmm. to see the world through their eyes, imagining, mm -hmm. um, being imaginal, mm -hmm. looking, then you come back with an, a kind of Occam's razor to yeah snip away what's irrelevant and 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 be, be more focused on what's actually relevant what matters what what doesn't and so i'm not yeah i'm really glad I, yeah i'm, I'm yeah 100 behind what you're saying yeah. that that uh studying knowing these things uh and maybe doing some um you know spending an hour on a microscope with planaria or out in the field you know Pulling or up just reading, or, or just reading Michael's work, you know, reading Levin's work, and yeah. and and then experiencing a butterfly, or you know, yeah. you don't have to necessarily do what they do, but I do think that these yeah. these things show up in the world around us all the time, and once yeah. you know what to look for, they become real. They become part of the. There's a yeah. deep phenomenology to be yeah. had here that we're missing. Many of us are just missing. For, 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 I'll say I made the comment about wisdom energy. Uh, the one thing I kept repeating was I feel it in my cells now I'm a you know as a psychologist but there's a I felt it in my cells there was some and obviously mm. I'm worried about the projection but I there was a re there felt like a grounded re-embodiment whether it goes down to gap junctions that what <laughs> but man that was the the best way I can describe it is I feel it in my cells and you know where exactly that is metaphorically relative to whatever but there there is that felt it, it does seem to be a deeper access resonance structure for me. Uh, uh, Rita? And then yeah, I just want to add, I'll add some things again, because I'm not constrained by science. Um, when I read Levin and, you know, read about the gap junctions and listened to him talk about the gap junctions, to me, 
you know, Greg, what you just said that what you're feeling happening right now. So like when the gap junctions form and the cells no longer know if the information is coming from them or from another cell because that other cell is no longer an other cell, it is now a collective. Um, that's what I see as needing to happen on a cultural scale, right? And so it's like, it's intimacy. Like I'll talk about how I think that like intimacy is endangered or it's that like with the way that that spiral, like it takes time to do that spiral, to get all the way there. It takes time, it takes rigor. And so when you connect deeply with a person or a place or like that connection where you your boundaries dissolve and you you start to no longer know if the information is coming from you or from the outside world because you're now one in the same to me that is a, a fractal of those gap junctions yeah 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 so I, yeah, i'm all I'm, I'm for this i'm glad the conversation's going this way it's uh because the, these um, for me moments of uh kind of more mystical revelation or oneness or um, um, it, it definitely gets informed by knowledge and spending time in knowledge. I mean, our knowledge becomes a kind of a, a world unto itself. Uh, Greg, you'll have thought a lot about this. You know, our understanding of these various levels becomes maps in our own, becomes territories in our own mind. And the more, this was brought up a lot yesterday too, the course, the need for the correspondence between the models in our mind and the world uh, to sort of help make a unity between self and world, which we need more of. And yeah, so this this was all going in a you know, for my opinion, in a really good direction. Well, the the uh, the essence, another way of framing you talk is marry the coin. That is your embodied experience of being to the tree. That's a scientific knowledge in the garden, which is a collective wisdom under God, which is the ultimate good. Um, and, 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 and the harmonizing of that, um, is what I feel like the culture, if we're going to get through the hurricane that we situated ourselves in, uh, and recognize the kind of entropy we're producing and do so in a way that gives ourselves future, that, that's, that's the kind of plugging in we need to collectively figure out how to do. I, I sort of seem like I tapped into, I don't know how to collectively, but we'll see. Mm -hmm. um, I love your sobriety, Greg. <laughs> uh um listen uh, i know brendan uh brendan graham dempsey we kind of had an early question there are actually quite a few questions in the chat brendan if you hear us since you had sort of primacy i wanted to make sure we got back to you uh if you happen to be present at this juncture um okay uh if not uh if certainly feel free folks to uh, raise your hands. There are a couple of other questions that I thought were quite uh, powerful. In fact, uh, um, listen, uh, this is a question for Rita. Uh, in Oika, the wisdom seems to be self-generative rather than prescriptive. Am I reading that right? Are there certain pieces of knowledge, wisdom, uh, precepts that you encourage in participants? Yeah, I think that you. was lotus and i think that yep. they left um i wrote a little answer in the chat but um but yeah i mean i think rich can chime in here too i think no like i would not say that it is prescriptive at all um however there's like there's content there's science there's concepts um there are practices but i hesitate to use that word because they're like they're so flexible that they're just kind of they're for the people who who need a little nudge to kind of get outside or get going a little bit um and and they can be sort of fit into lives in any way that like the people want to and and then they end up just self-generating so um it's it's a lot of like being and participating um for those of us that are familiar with the four p's i like to say that like Boyka essentially like uses all four of them and conflates all four of them and then you're able to find consilience among all of them like when i said participatory like maps onto propositional, like that's what happens. And so you create this really resilient structure by having all of them present. But, but you know, I think participatory too often gets kind of, it's kind of the last one to come along. It is just as important, if not more important than, cause you're not, um, you know, it's like, you're not going to believe the things, at least, I don't know, the way my mind works. Like I need to experience it in order to then actually you know, validate or like understand the more propositional concepts. And so um, 
you know, there's different people that work different ways, but they're all present so that they can all kind of link together and unite and create this like whole experience. I would just follow that up real quickly to say, no, it's not prescriptive. And if we do it right, it doesn't need to be prescriptive mm. because you are your subject. You, there's a certain, that's, that's, it's just not, prescri you can't prescribe wisdom. You know, you feel wisdom, you live wisdom. That's all. It's so no, I don't think there's any pres prescribing of anything. It's really just about telling that story of continuity and what to do ma makes sense. Yeah. And I would just reiterate, like when I said that it's the, it's a, like an infinite container that like fits all personal cultural practices, like you're going to find it in a lot of, so again, it's just like, it's so not prescriptive that it's actually like available to any way of being or living because it's like, it's there for everybody. And a lot of people have probably, it's probably familiar to a lot of people anyway, on this call. Somebody just put, uh, Lizelle just put, it's in your cells. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Uh, let's, I uh, Oh, go ahead. It, it, Greg, just one thing. I know there's a hand up, but just, just to um, uh, bring it back a little bit to big history, because uh, Ken Baskin's here, and I just, I, I the last time there was really a, an in-person meeting in big history, it was very clear in the in the three-day of a big history meeting, the actual, the official big history group, right, there's a, there is an international big history association. Um, de definitely within big history, the, the talks and the panels spanned the uh, here's the newest findings in the science we need to bring into big history. And now we're doing uh, um, a, a, a meditation, you know, you know, mm -hmm. Eastern religion led meditation on aspects of big history uh, and, and artists. I mean, sort of spanning this, the same gap that we've been, actually Oika has been, uh, uh, you know, dealing with kind of spanning the kind of, the, you know, the, 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 the firmer facts and, and then interpretation and expression by people. So I just want to bring that up about the big history association itself. It has, it has all these aspects in it. Great. Uh, let's let George Toma and then maybe Ken will come back to you. Uh, George Toma, if you unmute. Hi, uh, is the microphone good enough? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you so much for the presentation and the space provided for us. Uh, I will show this, I will kick it back to a higher level of abstraction. I hope this can land. Um, this is more for Professor Jordan and Tyler. I was wondering, wondering if you see emerging evolutionary pressures coming from the geopolitical state's plane, dynamics that incinerate instead of harmonize in both physical and conceptual dim dimensions. And perhaps what would be some implications downstream in the political arena in terms of limited affordances or impoverished harmony? I, my answer to your first question is yes, about the incineration aspects. My second, the answer to my second question is that your second question, I we do have to think about this, the states, the geopolitical states, because if they're the they're the unit, the main unit coming out of the pre the, the prior event of combogenesis, and we are in it as individuals thinking deeply about the changes in the states. And specifically, we, we see this going on with borders. Borders are under um, they're, they're in play. They're in an evolutionary uh, play right now about what to do about transfers of culture and I, I don't have an answer to it but to focus on that to, to to focus on what your question was i think is a good thing to think about yeah earlier in my talk i mentioned the idea of credit card companies and it came off as a joke yet if you think about tax law if you think about international travel laws if you think about commerce laws these are the cultural equivalents of processes taking place within a single cell that keeps the system whole. And, you know, credit card companies are there to keep energy moving in a particular way to sustain the group that produced it. Your comments about incendiary are totally on target. And that, that has to do with our ability to understand and manage and exploit energy in ways that perhaps we've not been able to do so. Um, so for me, I, as I also said in my talk, I think borders are necessary. So as a matter of fact, borders are necessary if a system's going to be a system. 
So the question then is, the, the, how do we get the world to experience itself as part of Gaia? How do we get the, the cultures to experience themselves as part of something, or in other words, that's an other, that's not another group of human beings? Why can't poverty be the other? Why can't lack of education and healthcare be the other? And in particularly the United States in the last 50 years, we've, 50 years, we've almost given up I'm using these big concepts as the other, right? We focus more and more on deregulation, which led to wealth and energy going to a smaller number of people. And you can see the de destruction of the American middle class. You see Joe Biden doing things now that are attempting to reorganize things in ways that we were doing 50 years ago. So um, if we want to try to get to a different place, work against the incineration, the potential threat of all life being destroyed, we have to create, we have to work, we would have to work to create a we that has a more abstract other um, than just another group of people. Thank you. Uh, okay, Ken, I know we are supposed to leave it at 1230, but we can- This is just, this is very brief, Greg. I just sure. wanted to add to what Tyler said that there is something of a civil war going on within the big history community. There are many, many people who want to stick to the Newtonian understanding that subjectivity is not to be dealt with by science. It is so bad that many of the Europeans broke off from the IBHA because they hear the word religion and they all but break out in hives. Oh. Um, so I am so delighted to be in this group where people see that big history should be about the whole ball of wax and not just the stuff that you can measure with a caliper. And if anyone wants to talk about that and opportunities for doing something about it, please feel free to get in touch with me. I want to talk about that. I'm a refugee from that civil war. So yes. Okay, let's talk sometime, Rich. Love to, Ken. Nice I'll to talk you. about it too, because big historians actually don't have much real connection with psychology. And they don't know how fucked up, sorry, psychology ends up being. And if you actually want science and subjectivity together, you actually need to address the problem of psychology. So uh, it turns <laughs> out that that's really where an enormous amount of our enlightenment gap uh, shit show ends up being, sorry for my uh, reduction <laughs> into the base uh, of our animalistic natures. <laughs> that's the work of this session though, right? Like that's, that's the, the work, work of, of this. That's the work of consilience. That is the work yeah. of, this is why, you know, this is why E.O. Wilson's got, you know, E.O. Wilson's a naturalistic big history version, but he himself, if you pay any attention to what he actually writes in Consilience, it's like, I think I can do this from physics into biology, but you get into mind and culture and I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. You know, he tries to say he knows what he's talking about, but he didn't know what the hell he was talking about. Um, and you break the structure down because you end up trying to cannibalize the social sciences, humanities, and embodied experience of being into the language of natural science, which by itself, its old language game is an exterior epistemology that behaviorizes everything, which is fine, but you better actually put the subject back into the equation. And, and David Christian, who basically invented big history, uh, starts a couple of his books with these marvelous definitions of mythology as a shared map of, of a, ter a sometimes terrifying universe, and then refuses to deal with it. It's, <laughs> it's amazing. He was my supervisor. Uh, oh. <laughs> yeah, and, 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 and I think this is the real conversation about wisdom. Like what we're talking about here really is, the consilience that we're talking about here is the source of the wisdom that we're, the wisdom commons, like this is where it lives. If, if I could, um, one of the main, as I went through my talk, I repeatedly made it clear why, what was at stake for me in a conversation about being in an energy entropy system and the taste of ice cream and the, and the feeling of love have to be just as real. Suffering has to be just as real as a brick. And um, what I, 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 as I said in my talk, I think the honest impediment is our unwillingness to get rid of the dualism inherent in Christianity that we carried over, the lock carried over to the body-mind dichotomy, right? It's just the same thing, except you naturalize the spiritual, you call it mental, and we're still stuck with these epistemic gaps. And um, that's why for me, the, 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 the work was to make meaning 
not something we create, but something that we are. And <clears throat> that's took years to get to the notion of embodied context to get there. Then when I got to the concept of embodied context, I suddenly felt myself making connections with all, all kinds of indigenous ontologies that are completely ignored in contemporary scientific frameworks of, of where we are. So for me, mind, body, objective, subjective, these, these, that, these have to go uh, if we want to get do the kind of things we're talking about. Uh, great. We got Bernard, Bernard uh, Frey. Sorry if I said that. That's quite all right. Thanks. Thanks. Well, um, I had a question earlier, and this was now the perfect uh, delivery to to ask it. Um, during first of all, thank you very much for this beautiful session. Um, and um, so, uh, Jay Scott Jordan, um, you, um, I, I would be curious whether in your um, wild systems theory, do you make any assumptions on the directionality of life or, or the purpose of life? And um, the inspiration for my question, if you know it, was um, Robert Piercek's uh, Lila, an inquiry into morals, where he puts the seeking of dynamic quality as, an, yeah, as a directionality. So, um... I'll maybe I'll start off with a no and then it'll turn into a yes <laughs> in terms of the purpose. Um, all living systems are their own purpose. They are purpose. All of the work that constitutes a single cell is purpose. When we get to the point where we're using language to parse reality into chunks so that we can cooperate, then we might call one thing a purpose. We might call one thing a function. We might call one thing a part. And the curse of the brain <laughs> is that we don't feel ourselves generating those other rings. We don't feel ourselves generating that concept, part, purpose, function. And so we feel like we're just pointing to reality as it is, when in fact we can never escape the curse of the fact that our words, our concepts are like stones we put across a brook to try to get across. We made them, but we don't feel ourselves making them. So there is purpose in the sense that being is purpose. We just don't use the word purpose that way. All the work that goes on in a single cell is about sustaining that system. I think we're still rather in, embedded in, this, in, the, in the cultural shocks of, of giving up on the dualism of Christianity. And I think it's still buried in how the Western world thinks and works. And um, so if... This is why I said at the beginning of my talk, you know, I do podcasts on pop culture because artists get this stuff. You know, this is what they do. And they tell, they create narratives of belonging, being, and embeddedness. And there's purpose there. So is there any, is, is there any goal outside of everything that's giving us purpose? No, uh, that's not the way I would think about it. But are we purpose? Yes. I would say that we are purpose, right? And um, again, that's because when I say that, I'm simultaneously rejecting notions like physical, mental, and information, right? So um, yeah, I hope that answer made any sense. I truly appreciate the question and having the opportunity to chat about it in such a like-minded crew. Um, Scott, can I ask you a quick question uh, about uh, information? Yeah. Uh, so I'm sure you're aware uh, that there's a pretty tight connection between some forms of information and entropy. Uh, Claude Shannon's information theory in many ways can be thought of as uh, in having deep parallels with entropy. Uh, any thoughts about that? And then I'll pause and see, like in terms of, the, I had some contact with Tyler and maybe yeah. that would be a at a conceptual level, uh, coming back to the concept of information would be something I'd be really interested in. I think we'd have to spend a lot of time unpacking it. I'll just put it that way. But I'll throw it out there and see what your reaction is in relationship to it. Well, the first of all, again, very, very kind of you to ask the question. Uh, Shannon was an engineer and he created the concepts he needed to create to describe the phenomenon that he needed to describe, quantify it the way he needed to quantify it. 
and he would use terms like redundancy in a signal, right? Mm -hmm. Well, that's one way to talk about it. Well, we can also just talk about it as modulations taking place that might be repetitive, right? In other words, we don't have to call it a signal. Why do we call it a signal? Because we're dualists, right? We talk about it as carrying meaning, as if the wires themselves aren't about anything, right? No, the wires don't have aboutness. The wires have a function. That, that is a completely Western way of conceptualizing reality. And a, a lot of the Western world prided itself in giving up on the childish notion that trees have feelings. Well, you look at contemporary biology and it's clear biological systems have feelings, they have intelligence, they have anything we want to attribute to mind. So for me, <laughs> as we contribute the concept information as being... It's all right. I'll say this and I'll show I wouldn't up. say anything. I don't know. Sure, this yeah. could be a big let's look at we can come back to do some differentiation for her. Right, oh, okay. So so we're scaled up plants. That's yeah. I'm fine with that. Okay. I'm fine with us being scaled well, up. the nervous plants. system is probably yeah, I, I I know this is a bigger discussion. I it, it, I'm not I'm not going along with that so easily. Roots aren't good. nervous systems. This is Root this things. is very nice because now I know where all that fungus comes from. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. No roots are not. No roots are not. Uh, you know roots are not nerve. I, yes, they they respond. They have fractal characteristics. They're probing the environment, uh, but the, it's a different. It's a con. Your, it's your context thing. The plant is living in one place. The animal has to move. So I mean, there's there there are some. We can't throw out different. We can't throw out the role of differences. I don't. Not that I don't respect plants, but. I think we have to be careful calling them mind. I mean, I, uh, I see. Okay, so for me, the minute we try to find a place in reality where we start throwing in subjective terms, yeah, that is for me. That's what I had to work uh, my way out okay. of. Uh, okay, to the wild systems theory. So, okay, an electron has. I mean, you want to throw out information. You want to throw out my. So yes, yeah. So I, I mean, I, I, I appreciate your. You're saying what can we what can we say that is for, for sure solid with regard to context and evolution and border formation and matter and so I mean you, I I sometimes lean Greg's kind of like nudging me in the information direction but I kind of I tend to lean towards matter and information matter and energy fluxes uh, uh, I mean George Mobus who uh, is here uh, former president of the ISSS. Um, it even wants to bring that down information into um, in, into the atom, into the structure of the atom. Um, I, but that that's th this. Yeah. Uh, All right. I, this I, is I a love. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't have a final thing for this. Third, I, I do, right. Third, somebody just put in third summit required. I, I think this is a wonderful. I'd really look to uh, <laughs> let's have some fun with this. Maybe down the road, I'll shoot us an email. Uh, I have to I, myself. I need to head out and we are about. Uh, 10 or 15 minutes already over the and Bobby and I and, um, I and folks need to get Bobby is, is, is so. Bob's gonna Bobby will have something to say about this. <laughs> <laughs> I, have a lot, I have a lot to say about that. I I I I shared similar views, but they they changed uh because I do think there are distinctions between inanimate matter and living matter that requires that we talk about information. And I also think that you can have agency in biology. So you can have an information processing system that pushes back on the world that doesn't necessarily, th that's not the same as uh, an animal with a brain that actually has conscious experience. So I, I do think mm. these words represent distinctions that are important. But what's funny is all the other language you're using, talking about borders, it you know reminds me of Carl Friston's work with Markov Blankets. Um, so a lot of people using the same, and, you know, talking about entropy and Greg bringing up that point. So a lot of the language that you're using resonates with me, but then you want to leave out a lot of the concepts that I think actually work together perfectly with the other concepts that you're talking about. Sweet. Well, this, is, this is fantastic. I mean, yeah. that was the whole point of the work was to make it clear that the transformations in a tree are about, and there's yep. nothing in a tree that's not about and for me, that's what we later call consciousness in the scaled up form. Um, it's there from the beginning. All right, scaled up form. Okay, I'm gonna get a cup of tea, Bobby. Let's go, yeah. Tea. All right, folks, yeah. go do your little thing for 15 minutes. You got Bobby <laughs> coming up. Uh, I'll be talking about existential integrative psychotherapy in another room. Uh, we got a lot of exciting things still coming up uh, in this conference. This is beautiful, lovely, uh, rich, Rita, 
Scott, Tyler, and all, uh, and Bobby to come. Uh, beautiful stuff, folks. Uh, Ken, thanks for showing up, and everyone else. So, all right, folks, take your 15, and uh, back on our...